intended specifically not to be risk averse. That is, uh, that project, not simply because they're risk averse. Bit of a survey approach. Um, but let's start off with, uh, we have here the, the, the question. What are the key criteria, and I think we have on the slide right at the beginning, what are the key criteria that's necessary to get a successful company off the ground? And I think I, this is sort of relatively weighted, you know, what are the, what are the priority things that you need? Uh, and maybe, you know, the people answered, or people who didn't answer, you know, when you're thinking about starting a healthcare company, what is the first thing that comes to mind that you need? Innovation, okay, as a, as a concept, that's great. Um, if we put a bundle on innovation, what we'll, we'll use, how do you think about that? Intellectual property, okay, that's a good choice. What else do you need to get a company started? Uh, you need, you need a, 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 but how do you own, how do you, how do you, how do you possess that? How do you think the other thing is the model, the name that a more model? And you need to be able to articulate that. You need people, exactly, exactly. So uh, I, I think I would, I would uh, agree with the, this is what the survey said. Um, intellectual property, um, you know, when we talk about business model, uh, we talk about the uh, market, et cetera. Um, Particularly in a, in a biotech or science-based company, uh, the two key drivers here are intellectual property and clinical data. If you don't have clinical data, whatever can get you as close to clinical data as possible uh, are, are the two major drivers. So I think I would say that the, uh, for the internet, answering four biotech companies is we have nailed. So we, we jump in with one question in terms of from the venture capital point of view. You obviously want to be a terrific team, and you want to be great technology. Right? But if you have to choose between those two rather than investor as venture capital, I'll either having a great team or having a great technology. Which one do people think you would choose? You have a lot of teams, but who's that team with your hand up? And who's that tech a great technology? Hold on. For someone from technology, anyone want to express the reason why? Why do I go with the, you know, the super technology? Yep. Yeah. So, one more thing, the technology you can raise, you can raise funding, you can do it for. And who's that team? Somebody give me a reason why you like it. So, there may be, there will always be some problems with technology, but a great team will be able to push it for. I can tell you, if you brought the venture capital, it would always drive to the attitude, you went with the better team, because if the technology blew up, the drug has liver, toxic, liver toxicity, we couldn't figure that out until we got to the trial, but the liver toxicity is not going to be a drug for the If you have a great team, you still have something. And remember, once we invest, we're in. So, once we're in, it's like a marriage. You have a great technology, but allow the team, and that technology blows up. You got nothing. You got a great team, and the technology blows up. You don't need to live to decide. Good, good. So, we'll pick it up. Right, so the question is, what do you mean by clinical data? And yeah, that's a good point. But in a private situation, you're probably not going to start with clinical data. You need to start somewhere. But my point is that private technology companies are valued based on clinical data. So, if you don't have clinical data, if you don't have clinical data, it changes your valuation. Obviously, it goes down. But if you do have clinical data, then they'll try to predict what the valuation is based on high technical clinical data. Right? And the more important they'll come up, around particularly around the way you manage the company and the way you drive forward, the you should always be thinking about clinical data. And that's a good point. Right? So, I'm going to stop there and I'm going to go back to the question. Right? So, we analyze this from the point of the IT data management. So that's what makes sense for a biotech company. You can just think of a healthcare company situation where it would be uh, reversed, not on the management team side, but where IT and, and data wouldn't necessarily be important. So we can talk IT companies.
little radio studio with the basic come over. It's called WIHI. And we have a little radio broadcasting studio. We hired the um the um Jack Chaplin, who's the NPR health reporter, and she did a radio uh, program today on mobile van. And our team, the IHI team, in our diversity and inclusion work has adopted the idea of mobile health vans for uh, patients who have socioeconomic challenges and trying to get access to the normal delivery system. And so they've adopted the mobile vans and we imagine to interview the uh, anybody here? We have about we have about eleven hundred uh, people from all over the world learning about how you bring care out to patients when they don't have access to transportation to get to a hospital or they don't have insurance to get covered. So um, the other thing that's in the algorithm is the IHI Open School. And that's a resource that you, how many of you look at the Open School? That's a way for you all to learn uh, improvement skills, leadership, patient-centeredness, safety, uh, all for free, all virtual, and you can just go on to IHI.org and enroll in any of those programs for free. So it's how uh, 130 people can take an idea from the inner ring and reach millions of people every year in the other ring. Uh, let me just stop and say, do you have any questions or reactions to what I'm saying? And if you do, um, you pick up your hand and then we need to get a mic to you just for amplification. Sam, do you have a question? Oh, no, no. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. What is your response to, and I say this from personal experience working in mental health care and also selling, selling health insurance, I think there's a fundamental problem. There are not um, people in the healthcare system that um, are in place that allow patients to navigate the healthcare system effectively. And there, there needs to be healthcare navigators because it's, <clears throat> there's definitely a lack um, when patients get out from either physiological uh, you know, disease or malady or psychological disease or malady, and there's no one there to help them uh, form a path forward and set up a continuum of care, and, or even to make sure that if you get diagnosed with a chronic condition or got to become like cancer, that, that doctors and your healthcare professionals are adhering to all the clinical standards of care, and this is fundamentally lacking. Like. You're raising a huge problem, and I do agree with you, that the system right now is designed around what Susan Nixon Levitan from National Health calls What's the Matter Medicine. So the physician will say, What's the Matter? Depending on the response, they'll either prescribe or they'll refer. And then you end up in this morass of trying to make care sane and intelligible and patient-centered. And what I'm promoting is that we move from what's the matter medicine to what matters to you medicine. And if you're okay, I'm going to come back to some examples that will show exactly, will show some ideas and some models for navigation that I think are really promising. Yes. Thank you. I can't be direct with the I was curious to know, I mean, I've seen sometimes the most common sensible things are so innovative. Your triple bottom line approach, how has that, how have you seen respond to that in the field? And, and in that sense, we're making ways that others are approaching some of these problems. So the triple lane, when we first um, drew the triple lane, we drew a, um, a triangle. And we said, who wants to work on health? Who wants to work on care experiences, like hospital improvements, and who wants to work on cost per capita? And the response across the United States, and actually in many other countries, was, I'll take that kind of triangle, or I'll take this top. But even leaders from high and other integrated delivery systems, they were putting an emphasis on one side or the other. So what we ended up doing was we put, it, put a, a black dot in the middle, and we said, that's the role of an integrator. And it's a new role. It's not something that most hospitals, or most public health officials, or most economists are able to manage, because Hey, I'm Brock Reed, executive director of the Harvard Center for Business. Tonight we're on the campus of the Harvard Business School at the High Lab, the Innovation Lab, to talk about alternative funding sources for life science and companies. With us tonight, to lead that discussion, are our three panelists, whom you'll hear from in sequence, and then there'll be a question answer to that. First is Bill Thalman, professor of entrepreneurship at the Harvard Business School. Second is Roger Kinnaman, the director of the Harvard Innovation Fund, the Harvard Healthcare and Internal Venture uh, Capital Fund. And third is Michael Weingarten, director of the SDIR, the Small Business Investment Fund, at the National Campus Institute of International. Each one of them will share their perspective on different funding sources for new ideas from the academic labs that are trying to get out into the market. You'll see and hear stories about private philanthropy, about uh, angel funding, about government funding, and where each of those sources of capital can help bring your ideas and accelerate the innovation that we're all trying to about. Well, maybe we can get going because uh, I know the, the, snow, the unexpected snow is holding some people up, but uh, we have lots of things to talk about. Uh, so welcome and thank you for joining us here this evening. I'm Brock Reed, I'm the Executive Director of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, and we're really happy to uh, and honored to have the iLab host us here at the start of a new series about launching and creating and funding and operating life sciences businesses. And um, there's several, many people to thank. First of all, you all for coming and creating, creating this element. Um, second of all, uh, Jody and her colleague um, Gordon here at the iLab for hosting us and doing this in partnership with, with us. Um, and third, uh, not, not, not least of all the, the speakers, some of them who came from only a few feet away, um, and some came from cities and states away. So, uh, uh, way to thank the leader translation program, we'll um, uh, uh, introduce the, the speakers later. You have all their bios, so I will skip over that for the moment. But just a minute to tell you why we're doing this. The Stem Cell Institute at Harvard was set up eight years ago now as a way of cutting across all the schools of Harvard, including the business school, and all the Harvard affiliated hospitals, one of whom actually be represented on the panel tonight, and the person Roger Kenman appointed. Um, and was set up not to leverage that know-how, that intellectual capital, that uh, the scientific resource to conduct basic research that ultimately would result in cures and benefits for patients. So how do you connect all those dots in a system that can actually help make a difference in the world? One of the ways to make a difference in the world is not just conduct uh, research at the lab end, but actually bring it out into the market, whether it's through licensing, whether it's through creating startup companies, whether it's through partnering with, with larger companies, any form of up. So that is really why uh, starting this series, and we'll do more this fall and hopefully more this spring, uh, in partnership with iLab here at the business school, about how do we creatively address that challenge of getting great science ideas out of the lab and into the clinic and into the market is is a key element of our strategy and a key element of what we're all about. But also realizing that obviously we can't do it all on our own, so we need partners. Um, partners in thinking about it, such as faculty here at the business school in the form of Bill, partners in the form of partners in the form of Roger, and partners in the form of the government that, uh, like Michael Weingarten, who will uh, talk about some of the programs and uh, some of the, uh, the role of the government in some ways. And some of our subsequent series will talk about other types of partnerships as well. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jody, who I think will make a couple comments about the island. Um, first of all, thank you again for coming out in this crazy weather. Uh, we do two to three workshops a week, and um, I'm so pleased with the audience tonight, um, given the, uh, what's going on outside, so thank you. And I also see a lot of new faces. Um, which is part of the purpose of this event is to introduce you to the IAM and what we do. So I just want to give you a brief overview of some of the things that are going on here 
Uh, you're not familiar with the iLab or Jeffers time here. Uh, we are a university-wide endeavor, and that makes us quite unique around Harvard. We are trying to facilitate interactions uh, among all schools at Harvard, uh, which we think will really elevate entrepreneurship and the opportunities uh, that can come about when you do that. Um, we support all entrepreneurial endeavors, founders and joiners. We uh, do that in a number of different ways. We, um, we like to talk about our program areas in terms of a few different buckets. We have our physical space, which is 30,000 square feet of space, 24 conference rooms, um, a lot of different uh, interactive um, configurable space that uh, you can utilize uh, to work on your ventures, uh, and the community that's associated with that. It's a big component of it. It's uh, being around like-minded people who are working on commercializing ideas alongside you. Um, and then from a programming standpoint, uh, we have uh, expert resourcing, and that takes the form of a number of different things. Workshops are one of them. We do two to three a week, uh, about 70 to 80 a year. All topics of entrepreneurship, helping resource you to get your ideas off the ground. Uh, we're really excited. This is our first uh, life science series, uh, which is new for us, and uh, we're really excited to offer more industry-specific series as well. Uh, we also have 29 entrepreneurs and experts in residence, as well as a number of what we call Harvard Innovation Partners, law firms, PC firms, design firms, etc. They're all here at resources to um, you can set up appointments and meet one-on-one with these folks. Highly encourage you to take advantage of that as well. Um, and then we have um, mentorship programs and all sorts of other meetups and um, immersion events uh, that are opportunities for team formation and idea generation as well. Um, one thing to highlight that just got announced recently is our President's Challenge, which uh, focuses on solving some of the world's largest problems in the areas of social entrepreneurship. And it's a great way for uh, support teams to see mentorship, um, workshops associated with it, and then there are prizes at the end as well. Um, I'm going to end there because there's an endless amount of things that uh, we provide, and I encourage you to check out our website and uh, subscribe to our newsletter, which is we send out weekly, which will give you a list of all of the IRs who will be here, all of the workshops that will be happening, and all the other events. Uh, but we're really excited to have you here and uh, hope to see you again soon. And with that, I'll turn it over to Good evening. Um, my name is Wei Zhen. I'm the Director of Commercial Strategy for HSCI and uh, also on responsible for our translational program. Did I not turn it on? I, um, I'd like to join Brock and Jody in welcoming you to today's event. Just to get to know you a little better, how many of you are scientists? Meaning, like, day job is studying science or conducting research? Great. Um, how many of you either have a startup idea that you're actively participating or you have already incorporated a company? Oh, that's a great list. Um, me. So as Bob mentioned, we have more events coming up uh, this year. Uh, there, uh, there are two. Next Wednesday, we have a panel of VC investors discussing winning contracts for tech startups in the current funding environment. Uh, on November 27th, Kamal Michael Roberts are going to talk about starting a life sciences company. And Jody and I are excited. We are talking to the trade to show that are just the challenges that you would face or people face to either start or grow a non life sciences company. Now, before I turn it over to our distinguished panel, uh, I want to like, well, highlight how the company in the audience may be able to connect with Harvard Themselves, Harvard Themselves Institute's uh, translational program. So we have and will continue to build a good infrastructure to support Harvard investigators' translational efforts through our translational uh, grants or through our core facilities. For example, our core facilities include the Law Molecule Therapeutic Training Center, uh, the Center for Human Antibody Therapy, and the Center for Human Health. And for those of you in the audience who are industry veterans or engineers or investors, we would love to seek your support uh, by providing mentorship to our investigators, uh, providing input on the program that we will be uh, considering for investment, and also we would love to partner with you to think out and commercialize our discoveries. Today, uh, we're very lucky to have three panelists who have very deep experience in funding life science adventures. Uh, the format of today's session is each of the panelists will speak for about 20 to 30 minutes. So please hold all your questions towards the end uh, uh, during the, for the Q&A session. And our first speaker is Bill Hall, uh, who is the D3 D.O.C. Thank you to the Vice Professor of Business Administration. So he's also the uh, senior, senior associate dean of external relations at Harvard Business School. He's also the chairman of uh, our advisory committee. Uh, our second speaker will be Roger Sitterman, who is the Managing Director for Harvard Healthcare Innovation Fund. And our last speaker, who flew from Maryland, uh, is uh, Michael Wingardson, who is the Director of SDRR and SDPR programs at the National Center Institute. Uh, so please join me to welcome our panel. Uh, so I'm Bill Solomon, and uh, just by way of background, uh, I've been here at Harvard Business School for now uh, 39 years. So it's a relatively easy for me to find this corner. Uh, uh, I've been on the faculty for 31 years, and for the 